lovely to be here. I'm Jay, this is Prashant, we're from Pulsar, and we're here today to talk to you about, um, well, to introduce ourselves, introduce our platform, and talk about some work we're doing around trends, actually. So, first off, introductions. Um, Pulsar is an audience intelligence platform. We exist to help our customers find meaning in an ever fragmented world. So the media is, you know, this isn't news to you, the media landscape is increasingly fragmented. Increasingly there are communities and niches in place of where there used to be mass media. We talk about it often about the nichification of the internet at Pulsar. All sorts of things going on at the moment, whether it's Elon and Twitter, climate conversations, um, meta, the metaverse, there's huge conversations, all of which have sub-communities and sub-divisions uh, and niches increasingly happening online. And we exist to help brands and our customers find meaning in all of that conversation. We combine conversational and behavioral data sets and we apply AI and just smart minds like Prashant, mainly not mine, uh, to help organizations understand what the meaning is in these conversations. So the best way I can describe what we do is really to think about the data that we, have, that we have access to and what we do with it. So the first thing we do is we ingest media data. We have a platform that ingests traditional media data, whether it's broadcast, print, radio, you name it, we ingest that data. And that is data we use to give us signals to understand um, influencers. Who are the people setting the agenda and what's the agenda that they're setting? Social data. We just talked about social data, but social data we use as a way to understand the general population. What are the behaviors, sorry, what are the perceptions and what are the attitudes that the uh, general population have on any particular topic? We ingest search data, which gives us, we use as a proxy for behavior. Um, we find this really strong correlation between people Googling something and actual real world behaviors. It's a much more kind of private, personal experience than tweeting, for example, which is where you broadcast an opinion, doesn't actually mean you're going to do anything different. Search data is different. Search is, search is a proxy for behavior. Uh, and then anything else, any other third data set that we can have access to, we bring all of that data together, in, data together into our own tools, into what we call the attention trail. So we bring all of this data, which starts at the kind of the catalyst, the people setting the agenda. We understand the impact that has on communities and on the overall conversation and then follow that through to understand what impact that has on behaviors. So through this spectrum of data, what access that gives us is we understand audiences and we understand how audiences interact on any particular topic, on any particular um, kind of uh, interest group. This is a kind of visual representation of that kind of data. So what we're looking at here is the way that that data and those kind of trends and those communities and those, those kind of conversations morph over time. And the way we like to think about ourselves is that's obviously a mess. That's really difficult to get your head around. And what Pulsar does is acts as a prison. So Pulsar takes all that data, that kind of the purity of the data that it ingests, and it delivers a rainbow. It gives you all of the color of the community and of the niches that sit around that, that topic. But that's not this. Social, uh, audience intelligence is not social listening. It's not counting tweets. It's not giving you sentiment. You know, it's not a dashboard where you are watching the conversation. It goes to the, the speech earlier, actually, around the difference between monitoring and, and um, taking action. So we are not an audience, sorry, we are not a social listening platform. We are an audience intelligence platform. And we thought, how can we best explain this? And actually, what we're going to do is give you a couple of examples of what that looks like in practice for us. So this is a real-world example. This is from a project we did with Samba TV uh, in the state where we took their viewing data and we took our data, we put it through the prism, and this is the story that we found. What we were looking at was a conversation around 30 different TV shows. Some of them linear, some of them not. I should actually just explain what we're looking at here. So each one of these clusters is a, is a community. It's a conversation. The size of the bubble relates to the kind of the volume and the intensity of the conversation within that sub-community. The different colors relate to different communities around that topic. So for example, if we take The Walking Dead middle on the left there, each one of those color groups relates to a different community. It might be, I don't know, people that like dogs. And that, is a, that light blue might represent the conversation that people who like, people who like dogs were having about the, walking, uh, the way Walking Dead. I'm sure there wasn't a huge crossover, but that was the first thing that came to mind. Um, so that's what we're looking at. And the first thing you can see here from an audience intelligence point of view is the audiences are very different. 
the audience around the bachelorette is much more distributed. There are certain key bubbles that really stand out. They are the key influencers driving a conversation. And it's very different to The Walking Dead or to um, uh, one of the, the kind of the genre conversations, for example, action, where there is a lot of bigger bubbles, is a lot more kind of, um, kind, of uh, 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 um, kind of active conversation. So we did this work with, with Sam TV. We found these, all of these communities. In fact, we found over 90 discrete communities having conversations about these 30 TV shows. That's a lot of audiences, and actually too many audiences to really allow us to give kind of actionable insight to our brands and our partners. So the first thing we did when we started with these kind of 90 discrete communities is look at how can we reduce that complexity. And what we found was 12 um, archetypes to sit across those communities. These are groups of, um, groups of communities and conversations that have kind of common themes, whether it's sports fans, socialites, show super fans, etc. So that helps us take the, the insight on from an individual show and an individual community point of view and take it on a step further. What that enables us to do is then start mapping out how things change. And this is where it gets really interesting and really where the power of Pulsar comes into play because conversation isn't static, right? Things move, things change. And as brands, what, what we find our clients and our partners are always keen on understanding is where are trends go, coming and going? What's the next big thing? How should I get involved and who should I get involved with? And that's what Pulsar really helps our partners do. What you can see here is how conversations on the same show shame, changed over time. So if we look at The Walking Dead there on the left, season nine versus 10, you can just see visually, right? The images look very different. The, the conversation was very different season nine, season 10. What you can see there is actually a change in the composition of the, the sub-communities making up that conversation. In fact, if sticking with that example, the conversation amongst gamers and, and media and entertainment mainstreamers dropped pretty significantly at the same time as the conversation amongst supernatural fans and subculturists rose. So that gives us something that we can help our partners understand then, that these conversations are changing and these are the people driving these conversations. And what became really interesting here was when we then added in the Samba TV data, which is the viewing data. And what we were able to then start modeling is actually show lifespans over time. So not only what is the conversation, but how does that match and how does that correlate? And what kind of, um, kind of drivers can we look at to understand not just where the conversation is growing and declining, but actually materially is viewership growing or declining? And who is grow growing and declining that viewership? And what's the relationship between those two things? And what we found was really interesting, and I think this makes sense logically, but it's nice to have it validated in the data, is that as you get a change in conversation where the community comprises of much greater um, uh, volume of people that are mainstream, whether they are media and entertainment mainstreamers, show superfans, TV and movie buffs, that really shows you that the, the show is on an upward trajectory. It's going to get more viewers the more those kind of um, communities are talking about the subject. Then on the other side, on the, the kind of the decline, what you find is actually you get a reduction in those kinds of groups and, and really a, a hardcore set of um, super fans begin to talk about that topic, whether they are show super fans or actually fans of the context of the show, for example, Supernatural in, in the case of The Walking Dead. So what we actually found through this work is that not only can you plot the conversation, understand the audiences driving the conversation around these TV shows, but you can also understand the conversation and so the composition of those conversations and use that as a predictor for the future growth or decline of that TV show. So it's just an example of how we use audience intelligence at Pulsar to help us predict trends. And that's really the meat of what we want to talk to you about today. So one other example I'll give you and then I'll hand over to Prashant who can give you some real world examples of trends in SEA as they currently are, are happening. So the other example I want to talk about is in the context of our, our customers who, who we currently work with. Pulsar currently works with a set of clients, mainly across um, uh, media and entertainment and technology. We're headquartered in London, have offices um, across the globe, uh, and a large client base in the US. And the one I really want to focus on is Twitter, um, partly because I was at Twitter for eight years previously, um, and I know this work inside out as a result, um, but also because it's one of our key strategic relationships, and I think a really interesting story to tell because Twitter come to us to understand Twitter data, which is pretty unique. 
So the work we do with Twitter, we have, we have two relationships with them. We work with them on a campaign basis to help their clients understand the impact of their, their campaigns. But actually, the story I want to talk to you about is a project we do around uh, Twitter trends. So we partner with Twitter's B2B marketing team. Uh, it's an annual study we've done for the last few years. Uh, and the point of this study is to really help them understand the trends as they are currently happening on Twitter. So we are Twitter's trends platform, insight trends platform of choice. We help them understand not just the big trends in any given year, but also what are the kind of the up and coming trends for the future. This creates the key content of Twitter take to market in all of their B2B marketing. It's the kind of the keynote content for their, their CAN um, presentations, which is a big flag, flag, flagship event for them every summer, as well as events like South by Southwest and CES. So it's a really core bit of what they do. So this is an example of the work we did in 2022 with them. Um, we found various trends, which are, you know, we'll, we'll play in the video, so I won't read out what's on the screen. But effectively, the really uh, interesting thing here was we helped Twitter call out the trends that are happening on their platform using a kind of a now, next, and watch framework. So what are the big trends now happening across all of the tweets happening on the platform? What's coming up in the immediate term? And then what's coming up in the long term? So it's uh, trends as they exist today, and what opportunities are there for brands to get involved with those trends? Trends as they exist tomorrow, and again, what are the opportunities? And then what are the future trends, you know, not just the day after tomorrow, but next month, next year? And what opportunities are there for brands to help shape those trends? I'm gonna hand over to Prashant now, who's gonna talk you through some examples of that as it relates to SEA. Thank you, Jake. And I hope the clicker gods are with me. So I'll say a sweet prayer before I start. All right, so until now, we have looked at uh, narratives, right? So things that are happening, things as we check our phones, and things that are blowing up, and how we can participate in those narratives, and then have a brand angle, or choose not to participate at all. With these narratives start the audiences, their stories, their networks, and the opportunities for all of us. This gives rise to trends, and trends is something we can act on. We also looked at how brands like all the way from Twitter to Levi's are using these trends and how they are unlocking opportunities. We look at a framework on how we do this. So we'll just open the lid, look under the hood, and then we look at a case study on something from Southeast Asia on inflation, something that is making us pay quite a bit. All right, so let's start with narratives. So how do narratives start? Uh, conversations on social uh, starts more of an anomaly, starts to blow up, uh, people start getting on those trends. So think of $8 Twitter. Uh, I just saw that there was a tweet from Elon Musk talking about a t-shirt. Uh, got to wear the t-shirt for $8 Twitter and then pay for it. So conversations that are happening online. And then people starting to search uh, because it's about twin peaks, right? One peak is all about, hey, conversations are happening. And the second peak is about silent majority and how we start to search things up. Because we all don't tweet all the time, but we engage, we start to search. So we look at these two signals. And then we start to pass them through some matrix. Now some examples, right? Things we all have been thinking about. So if you're thinking about, oh, shall I participate in being in a metaverse? And you look at on annual volumes, right? So last year it was blowing up. And this year, last time I heard, Decentraland had about 38 users. That's pretty much it. And we can see that how these trends might be quite high. But the monstrosity of these trends and the complexities of our internal systems, how we manage our stakeholders, it creates an inefficiency in the system, which is all about, do I act on this trend now, now, or should I wait? And if I wait, what happens? Am I too late in the trend? So this model is all about understanding those two complexities and then figuring out how do we chart a way forward. When we pass these through uh, these through signals through the matrix, we end up having a bunch of bets. So let's say you are trying to activate a mental health campaign. And mental health can be looked at from different perspectives. It can be people who are having long COVID and they're thinking about it versus quiet quitting that happened within Gen Z's and the bunch of layoffs that are happening right now and the mental health associated with it. So you can look at mental health in different dimensions if you are looking to create a campaign. So these are a bunch of bets that you have at your table. Now, which one do you activate because you need to look at data-driven approach so that you can manage the complexity of internal stakeholders? Nicole talked about the whole point of 
driving an insight internally, right? So the whole empathy thing. And this is where the last inverted triangle comes in, which is all about how do we look at trend discovery all the way to the major trends that we can act on, and more importantly, the audiences that are talking about them. We'll be categorical in saying that it's not newsjacking. We are not talking about something that just comes up, Rishi Sonak went to Downing Street and a bunch of slippers outside it, if you have seen the Airbnb newsjacking. We are not talking about that, because that's high pressure. You gotta activate in two days, and then you gotta look at the entire organization to move with you, because you're putting something out there. That's not trend spotting, that's news checking. What we are talking about is something which is more midterm, something that you can really manage, and something which is more insights driven. It started with the first thing, which was all about how COVID came in, and then we had, can we just look some clicks now? How money was printed, uh, it became kind of a toilet paper with so much money in the system, and then we had the whole asset boom, which was all about the board apes going up, which blew up inflation because prices, supply demand crisis, and then the prices went high. And that's the heat that we all are feeling, right? But it's all about how does it really impact the consumer? Because on one side, it's all about, yes, we can charge the consumers for it, but do the inflation expectations become so entrenched that consumers start to plan for it, and that's where a bubble starts to form up? So how do you look at inflation from both perspectives and really see that, how does it impact my category? So there are multiple questions that come in. And the questions are all about, does the inflation match up to the expectations of the consumer? So you get the inflation data on a month-on-month -month basis. But are consumers analysts? They are not. So it's all about, hey, am I going to think that inflation is going to be rising for the next one year? And how do I plan for it? Do I start to eat up from my savings? or do I start to take loans? Which led to the trend, buy now, pay later. Something that we have heard quite a bit in 2022. And this was all about going for installments, whether it's 0% or 10%, we don't know, which leads to quite a bit of partnerships happening through super apps, right, from e-commerce, and through different categories that participate in it. Whether you're buying a bubble tea or a phone, and are you paying for bubble tea, buy now, pay later? I hope not, but let's see. All right, so what we did was we looked at three different variables. So the line in green is all about actual inflation, the data that comes out. The line in blue is all about consumers talking about inflation expectations. Things like things are expensive. And then the line in pink is all about buy now, pay later conversations. So what you're gonna see is the line in green dwindles and it goes up and down, that's real inflation. We are living in treacherous times right now. But the line in blue and pink are all the way up, which is all about consumers are expecting inflation to continue. And this is revealing from the social data. So let's look at what's happening over here. So we looked at different markets, Philippines as well as Malaysia, and we said, who are the people who are talking about inflation? So what you're gonna see on the left-hand side is Philippines, and the conversation's are all about people who are looking up for the influencers and the stuff that they're propagating. These are more millennials, but you also see Gen Zs, which are the K-pop buyers and sellers and the Pinoy Pop conversationalist. On the right-hand side, you have Malaysia, which is all about people who are having payments as a seamless way to their life. They're pretty tech-savvy, and they wanna pay through the Apple Watch, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have people who are cashless K-popers who are looking to buy merchandise. And these two markets are quite different culturally, but what we see is a commonality which is triggered by buy now, pay later, and some, a trend that's happening within Gen Zs. We feel that Gen Zs are going into a consumer bubble, and they might be laden up with debt. That's what the consumer data is telling us. So we started to look at different brands and how they pair up in terms of payments whether it's pay later brands or it's pay now brands. And we looked at different e-commerce websites who are also participating in it. So what you see is a very interesting trend. On the top right is all the big conversations that are happening, and these are heating up and they're pretty steady. So you would see all the way from Shopee Pay to Rely Pay Later and Alipay. But on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is 
pay later brands that are trying to come up, which are quite streaky in nature because these are when Gen Zs are looking to buy things and they are talking about it on social that, hey, it's a zero percent interest. Why don't you all buy it? And then it's laden by a K-pop star or a K-pop lifestyle. We also started to look at how these conversations are evolving on social. So on the left hand side, what you're seeing is when the buy now, pay later trend started, what was the initial euphoria about? And what you're seeing is that euphoria was pretty much as a category involves. It was all about bankless population, financial inclusion. It was about launching of 0% interest rates and consumers getting on that debt bubble. But on the right hand side, what you're seeing is how this category starts to get nuanced. What revealing was that we saw that millennials are not getting into consumer debt as Gen Z's are. What means is that we have to start to look at this new generation of consumers who may be earning lesser or may not be earning and how is the relationship with brand going to evolve if they're going to get into a debt bubble. That's a treacherous territory to be in. And this is where we are looking at even concert tickets being bought with pay later services. That's one of those big conversations that is happening online. And as new services launch in buy now, pay later, uh, you start to see these comparisons of interest rates. Finally, we looked at what is in it for brands, and we looked at different categories and assortment of brands. So all the way from bubble tea to a diamond drink, and we looked at, hey, is it being paid now, now? Or are people actually paying it later? And there is an Asian mindset that let's not get into a debt, right? So it's all about how does it really pan out as we are seeing inflation for the first time after decades. So what we saw was that brands like Apple are hedging both sides. So they are working with a grab pay and they're showing that if you buy an Apple product with a grab pay, you would get some kind of discounts because you're working through the platform and you can get those discounts which are much more attractive than the installments that you would pay with pay later. But you would also see jewelry brands that are actually skewing towards pay later and good luck to people who are proposing for the first time by buying diamond rings through pay later services. So that happened and that was all about understanding the evolution of this trend and how brands can really evolve from there. So what's the point here? The point is all about how do we look at narratives that we all started with? How do those narratives stand up to the stories and the networks within the audiences and how do we activate them, participate in it to stay relevant? And this is where the whole audience intelligence framework comes in. It starts from discovering the narrative, not really the audience, but the narrative, then starts to go into what kind of audiences are, be, are talking about these narratives and what stories are emerging. We start to map those and then medium and the message comes in, what kind of messages do we have to put in and what kind of mediums do we participate in. And a point to note is that the mediums are also getting complex. Now they're getting fragmented and there's a lot of conversations around that. And finally, measuring and optimizing. So we leave you with this last slide, which is all about what is in it for the future. What we are seeing is what's happening. And these are the things which are in our mind, right? Which is all about what's happening around me. Is it the evolution of AI and GPT-3 coming up? And we'll talk about it in tomorrow's panel, a, a small clip here. Or is it about mixed reality or inflation coming in? Or are we going to go into stagflation, et cetera? And how does it really impact my brand? And if you want to get started, let's think about audience intelligence and start to get into those narratives to see what is in it for us. Thank you.